Good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, I hope you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. Welcome to all of you, wherever you're calling in from. It's been great to see so many people from all over the world joining these webinars. Just by way of an introduction, I'm Raza Rahman. I'm a master's student in the economics department at SOAS, moderating today's webinar. This is the fifth webinar in the Economics of COVID-19 series. It's a series organized by the Department of Economics at SOAS and the Open Economics Forum, a student association part of the Rethinking Economics Network, which aims to introduce plurality in the economic debate. A huge thanks to everyone behind the scenes for organizing these webinars. I, for one, have found them really interesting. We've had some fantastic talks so far discussing the implications of COVID-19 on climate policy, feminist economics, the economic development of Latin America, and neoliberalism. If you haven't been able to attend any of the previous webinars, they have been recorded and they're available on the SOAS Economics website. This webinar will also be recorded and uploaded as soon as possible. To keep updated on future events, feel free to follow our social media accounts and keep the conversation going with the hashtag economics of COVID. Um, the details are in the chat box um, to your right. Today, we'll be turning to the macroeconomics of the COVID-19 crisis, specifically the implications of the crisis on the austerity agenda. The discourse on austerity has come back into the limelight, not that it ever really left, as commentators discuss how the decade of austerity has impacted the economy and overall resilience before the crisis hit. Additionally, unprecedented levels of government support as a response to the crisis have led um, to many questioning what the post-crisis regime will look like as government debt increases substantially. To discuss this topic, we have Dr. Joe Michel, Associate Professor in Economics at the University of the West of England. Joe is currently Secretary of the Post-Keynesian Economic Society and was a founder of Reteaching Economics. His areas of interest include macroeconomics, money and banking, income distribution, and Brexit. Before handing over to Joe, I'll just lay out the format of the webinar. Joe will be speaking for around 30 minutes, followed by an interactive Q&A session. So I strongly encourage you to submit any questions you have within the first 40 minutes of the session in the chat box to the right, or the right, whichever right is your right. We'll then compile these questions and put them to Joe during the Q&A session. I rambled on for far, far too long. So Joe, I'll hand over to you for the next 30 or so minutes. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, thank you very much for, for joining me. Um, I hope you are all well and uh, as, or as well as can be in these strange and uncertain times. Um, I'm doing okay here. My kids are downstairs. We're just about under control. So I've been given the internet for an hour. I've got a very old, old fashioned copper connection. Um, uh, but hopefully it'll hold up for just enough for us to get through this session. I'm going to leave Raza to control things like notifications and hands and stuff in the checkbox unless you want to jump in and tell me to do something. In fact, I'm just going to turn off the audio notifications because I'm getting beeps in my ear, which are likely to um, confuse me. Let me just turn that off. OK, I think I understand Blackboard well enough to do that. OK, so I've got about half an hour. I'll try and stick to my time. What I want to do, I'll, I'll lay out roughly what I want to talk about and then we'll see how uh, I do at getting through it on time. So I'm going to talk about the macroeconomics um, of the coronavirus, and in particular, what are the implications for macroeconomic policy? There's a big debate going on about what is the character of the coronavirus shock? Is it a demand shock? Is it a supply shock? How long will it last? Once we start coming out of lockdown, what are they, the correct policies um, to use, and in particular, the correct macroeconomic policies fiscal policy and monetary policy. Um, and there's a big debate there. So I'll, I'll try and say something about that. Before I talk about that, what I want to do is go back and say, and lay out the, the macroeconomic backdrop of the last decade, which, as Raza said, has been the decade of austerity. And already there are voices calling for post-corona austerity, because it's very clear that we're going to see sharp rises in government spending. We are seeing sharp rises in government spending, falls in tax revenue. That means higher budget deficits. It means higher government debt, debt to GDP ratios. And already there are people saying that as soon as we're through the most acute uh, phase of the medical emergency, then we really need, uh, along with easing the lockdown to get economic activity um, going again, we also need to start thinking about how we get uh, government finances on back what people 
say are a sustainable um, footing. And, and I'm going to conclude uh, in half an hour or so, or 25 minutes or so, to give you the punchline in advance by arguing that we don't need austerity. We, we are not going to need um, post-corona austerity. There will be difficult choices. Um, there will be trade-offs to be made. There will be political battles to be had. Um, but what we really do need to avoid is what we've seen for the last 10 years, which is those who are least able um, to take the hit, both financially, but also medically, uh, in terms of health, in terms of security, uh, in terms of um, you know overall well-being, we can't allow um, the people who have been you know, on the sharp end of austerity for the last 10 years to, to also be on the sharp end of um, the corona, post-corona shock. We know that those people are currently you know, suffering disproportionately during the coronavirus lockdown, both from the, the coronavirus itself and from the effects uh, of the economic lockdown, which I'll, I'll talk about. So that's sort of what I want to do. Um, we'll see how I how I get on for time. So let me let me start with laying out what I uh, what I mean by austerity and what I think of as austerity, because it's a word that's used a lot and it's not always precisely defined. Um, and you know, very generally, austerity means some kind of externally imposed uh, compression of consumption would be a very general um, definition. And that doesn't have to mean um, as a result of you know, weakness in government spending or cuts to government spending. You can think of historical examples, for example, during Soviet Russia or the Great Leap Forward in China, when actually big expansions in government spending on heavy industry and so on resulted in um, you know, in consumption compression for much of the population and in many cases terrible hardship and you know awful outcomes in terms of huge loss of life and, and broadly speaking you could think of that as a kind of austerity but that isn't what we've been using the term to mean uh, in the last decade in the UK and it isn't how I'm going to use it you know, for the rest of the, the seminar. What we mean by austerity is cuts to government spending in an attempt to reduce deficits with the intention of bringing down government debt to GDP ratios. That's what we've lived with for the last 10 years. We've been told, we were told from 2010 onwards when George Osborne became chancellor, that really the overriding policy goal of government in this country, which trumped all other policy goals really, was to, to get the public finances under control. And what we were told was that there was a, an immediate and present danger from the situation, the, the financial situation, uh, the, the government public financial situation in 2010, after the immediate effects of the 2008 financial crisis had passed, there was an immediate danger and therefore uh, the requirement was to, um, to bring the deficit under control. I'm going to briefly argue that that justification doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Um, and one of the things I think will become clear or is becoming clear as a result of the coronavirus expansion in government spending and the coming big rises in the deficit, we're going to see another big chunk added onto the government debt. And my hunch is we're going to see none of the problems which we were told we were facing 10 years ago in terms of investors in government debt, people who buy and hold government bonds. Those are the debt instruments that are issued by government to, to uh, cover the difference between taxation income and spending, uh, cash spending by governments. We were told that those investors wouldn't want to hold you know, government debt if debt to GDP ratios exceeded 80, 90, 100 percent, and therefore interest rates on government debt would rise. And this would put us in an unsustainable situation, which would ultimately mean sharp tax rises and, and real you know, falls in consumption for, for average people. What I think we're going to see is that that isn't true. And we're going to see that interest rates are likely to remain very subdued uh, on government debt. Um, and I think it was it was pretty clear even 10 years ago that that justification didn't hold water. There was very little evidence in the financial markets of bond holders, bond investors, not wanting to hold the, um, the, the instruments of rich country, big rich country um, treasuries like the UK and the US and Japan, for example. We already had the, the historical experience of Japan, which had debt to GDP ratios that were very high, much higher than, than we were looking at, you know, above 200 percent of GDP and very low uh, rates of interest on their debt. And if you if you really push people on this, because the, the last 10 years have been very difficult for the people who made that argument, because we've seen government debt to GDP has remained quite high 
important because austerity is actually not a very good way of reducing government debt to GDP. So those ratios have stayed quite high. And at the same time, interest rates have, got, have gone lower and lower. And on you know, much of developed, I shouldn't say, I don't like the word developed, on rich world um, government debt instruments, they're negative. Real interest rates are now negative, meaning that bond investors will actually pay for the privilege of having an asset that they regard as safe. You know, people are so, people who want to hold financial instruments are so keen to have something which they know will retain, you know, at least some of its value, a, a predictable amount of its value, that they will actually accept, you know, a negative uh, return on instruments. So when you push the Austerians and you say, well, look, you know, what was your justification? One justification was, of course, the famous Reinhardt and Rogoff paper, which was shown by Thomas Herndon, a brilliant PhD student, to have relied on a, a coding error in an Excel spreadsheet, I mean, literally a fat finger error in an Excel spreadsheet. This was Osborne's you know, usual justification when pressed. He would say this is the most important academic contribution and this is the overriding intellectual foundation of our government's policy. It was a fat finger error in Excel. So now that one is off the table. If pushed, they will say, well, look, there was a bond auction. You know, there was one bond auction when investors didn't show up and they didn't want to buy government bonds. And that shows that they were scared. But this was right in the heat of the financial mess of 2008, when bank balance sheets were under severe distress, when financial institutions were extremely focused on the immediate problems uh, of the crisis. It's not surprising that bond auctions were a little bit disorderly at that point. And there was only one. And there is literally no other evidence that I can really think of uh, beyond that one kind of blip 10 years ago that showed that this danger existed. So that's my kind of starting point is that we've had a decade of policy premised on the assertion that there is a, a lack of demand for UK government debt. And I think that assertion has been shown to be false. And I think it was quite, it was very hard to say there was a clear case that it was not false, even at the point we were 10 years ago. Now, what have the results of that 10 years of government cuts um, been? And I should just briefly note that there were also tax cuts during the, the period. And if they were really serious about bringing the deficit down, you wouldn't cut taxes at the same time as cutting government spending. And I think this does show that there was more going on than what, what we were told as the headline justification. You know, if you're taking money away on, by, with one hand, you know, by cutting disability uh, benefits, income to people who are disabled, while giving tax cuts to those at the upper end of the income distribution, it's a lot harder to say, well, that we're bringing down the deficit and we're all in it together. That's a, that's a fairly clear redistribution from, you know, a very vulnerable low income group to, a, you know, a very privileged and, and less vulnerable group. But the results of austerity, I think, are now very clear. We've got lots of good academic work that shows severe health effects. You know, we've seen rises in all kinds of um, health conditions, um, the macroeconomic effects uh, are fairly clear. We've had a very weak recovery. Income per head uh, has grown at one of the, the slowest rates post-crisis on record. Productivity is almost completely flat in, in this country. We've seen almost no productivity growth. Wage growth was negative for a sustained period. For, for several years, we had falling wages after the start of uh, austerity. Uh, and depending how you measure it, um, wages have just got back to where they were um, before the crisis uh, 10 years ago. Um, and we've got um, government cuts, particularly local cuts in places like in many of the most deprived places in the country. So the northeast is currently seeing one of the worst coronavirus outbreaks. It's actually overtaken, I think, London as, as the kind of the current center of the coronavirus outbreak. Government cuts in uh, the Northeast were absolutely brutal over the last um, decade. Um, and so it's, it's a kind of perfect storm. You know, the population has really suffered. They've suffered from deindustrialization, the loss of steady jobs. Over the longer run, there are many underlying health conditions there from, from coal mining and from the kind of jobs that, that were there. Then you had austerity, which really you know, compounded many of those infrastructural issues, social organization issues, health issues, and now the coronavirus shock um, coming on top of it. So I think it, the evidence is pretty clear that austerity was a very bad way to prepare uh, for the kind of pandemic which we're now facing. And then we can add to that the more immediate um, serious questions about the way the government has handled uh, the crisis, um, particularly things like how long they took to start the lockdown and so on. So that's the kind of the backdrop. Let me now say something about the debate about what's happening now and, and how policy should respond to the corona shock. 
And economists are fond of using the word shock because, to be honest, because there are a lot of things which are not in the models which have been used. And so you say something which isn't in the model is a shock. And quite often those things shouldn't really be shocks. So the financial crisis of 2008 was a shock because the models at the time didn't really have a, a, a well-developed financial sector and they didn't have the possibility that, that you know, finance could be very unstable and could generate this kind of uh, dynamics. But I do think it's reasonable to call coronavirus a shock. I think it's reasonable that macroeconomic models don't have you know, some kind of pandemic modeling parameter. And the debate has been shaped um, around you know, very crudely a sort of dichotomy, as these debates almost always are, between a group who say, well, this is a supply shock and a group who say this is a demand shock. And the policy response is very different depending on which of those two things uh, is true. So let me briefly lay out what I mean by a supply shock and a demand shock and then tell you where I, I come down on this debate and then I'll, I'll move on to the sort of the, the future uh, outlook. So a supply shock means, I mean, the sort of the, the easy mental uh, version of this is something like an asteroid strike or, or a, a natural disaster. You, you have an immediate destruction of economic productive active of, of capacity. You know, you lose power stations, roads, the, the physical infrastructure you need to produce uh, things. And if the population continue trying to spend the same amount of money buying goods and services with that degraded supply capacity with you know, say 10 or 15 percent less ability to actually produce goods and services you know in a simple economic model you get inflation because people then raise prices to ration the now um, short supply goods and there's a view that what we're seeing now is a supply shock uh, and the argument is well large numbers of people are forced to stay at home that's a huge negative labor supply shock there's a huge amount of labor which isn't coming into the productive process that means goods and services are not being produced and therefore what we're facing effectively is a supply side shock now that's a perfectly reasonable um, argument and i'll come back to to this one in a minute the, the danger that comes from a supply side shock as i sort of laid out in my example is an inflationary problem you, you get inflationary pressure because prices start to rise uh, and you therefore need um, policy to try and constrain um, that inflationary pressure. And usually that policy is, broadly speaking, unpleasant. It means some form of austerity or it means tighter monetary policy in the form of higher interest rates. It means kind of trying to constrain people's spending. The alternate, very crudely, side of the debate would say, well, look, no, it's not really a supply shock, or yes, maybe it is a supply shock, but what really matters here is an arm shock. Number one, people aren't spending. You know, people have been prevented from leaving their houses, that means they can't you know, go to the shops and buy the things they would normally buy. They can't go to the pub, they can't go to restaurants, they can't go to cinemas, they don't travel, they're not buying airline tickets, they're not buying train tickets. So we're seeing a huge reduction in expenditure and that's a demand shock. Uh, so there are people who are saying, look, this demand shock outweighs the supply shock. And I think everybody actually accepts that both things are happening. So the question is, it's magnitude. Which of these two effects is, is dominating? Uh, and those who are pointing to the demand shock are saying, well, look, what we need is a demand stimulus. We need a response to try and bring back the demand which is missing because people are not spending. And with interest rates at or very close to zero or in some cases negative, large amounts of quantitative easing already outstanding. Sure, the central bank is, is already looking at new and alternative policy tools, and we could maybe discuss some of those later on. But the short version is the demand side argument says we need fiscal policy. We need government spending to step in and take up um, the, the reduction in spending that we're seeing from the household side and also from the, the firm side, not buying intermediate goods and so on. My starting point on this is that for the point of that we are right now during lockdown, this isn't the really the right framework to use. It's very you know, I can understand why that framework is being used because it's the sort of standard macroeconomics framework. But I don't think we should think about the current period as really a normal economic period in which we're looking at the balance between a supply and a demand shock. What we're really trying to do, this is externally imposed by government to basically try and freeze the economy. We just want to, to stop economic activity. Um, we want to try and, you know, put the economy on ice, freeze frame it keep the, 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 the essentials running, you know, food delivery, um, basic infrastructure, power, internet, communications, the things which you know, have to, to keep going, uh, shut down the things which don't need to keep going, haircuts, 
um, nightclubs, etc. Um, and in that situation, yes, you expect a supply res response because that's what you're aiming to do. You're aiming to stop. Uh, <laughs> that's a debatable. Yeah, okay, but we come back to that one. Uh, I, there's, there's a range of policy options there, from number four to the full full on hippies. But let's let's come back to that. Um, so what we want to do is we want to shut down the economy. You know, we want supply to fall. We also want demand to fall. And we want to try and preserve the economy in the structure it is in with as little damage as possible so that when we start to come out of the uh, lockdown, and I think we have to think about the, how that is sequenced and the phasing and so on, because it's not going to be one day, you know, you flick a switch and we all go to the pub and, and, and talk about, well, well, that was a strange time, wasn't it? It's going to be very long and drawn out and possibly even... You know, in waves, you know, test it and see, realize a mistake was made, reimpose restrictions and so on. Um, I think until then, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of this supply demand framework. But the way I've been thinking of it is as an analog with central banking behavior. And central bank activity very crudely is divided into monetary policy, which is about managing, at least on paper, it's about managing spending and demand. You raise interest rates to stop people spending, you lower interest rates to make people spend more. It's a very crude, not very realistic version, I think, that we teach in, in standard macroeconomics. But I think the more important function, actually the more sort of historically uh, embedded function of central banks is, is lender of last resort. They are the institution which can create credit, which can, which can postpone payment until you know, next week, next month, next year. Banks can do it. You know, a bank can make a loan and say, I'll lend you a million pounds at 0% interest rate. And that effectively allows me to postpone all my other payments. You know, if the bank will give me a million pounds and say, you don't have to give it back for 50 years, fine. You know, I can pay off my mortgage. I can, I can you know, all the other debts which are coming due stop being a problem. But the banks aren't going to step up in a situation like this. The banks aren't going to go out looking for customers. Um, so the only institution really which can provide the credit, you know, the, the sort of the, the forbearance, the kicking the can down the road of, sure, you need to pay your mortgage, but the person who you're paying your mortgage to or let's say your rent, who you're paying your rent to needs that rent as an income in order to pay their mortgage. Uh, and the banks need the, the mortgage income in order to prevent their balance sheets deteriorating. So you've got these chains of payment and either you freeze them and you say nobody has to make payment, you know, for three months or six months or whatever, or you allow those payments to continue. But somebody ultimately picks up the tab and says, you basically all of you owe me. And, and at the end of it, we'll kind of tally it all up and work it out. And that's what I think. That's how I think the government act actions up till now are kind of functioning. They're a way of trying to keep the economy in freeze frame mostly in the second option you know they're doing it by saying you know we'll cover wage payments we'll allow we'll guarantee banks to make loans to keep credit flowing so that people can continue to make payments there is another school which says actually a better option would just be to sus suspend those payments i see that the nef the new economics foundation have a report today saying we should just suspend rent and mortgage payments rather than increasing credit from public institutions to allow them to continue, we should suspend them. And I think there's a there's a discussion to be had about which of those is better. But that's that's kind of how I think about what the policy reaction is, is trying to do. It's trying to kind of put the economy on ice, prevent balance sheets from deteriorating, pre prevent people from going bankrupt, from losing their houses, prevent jobs from, from going under, prevent firms from going bankrupt, uh, and so on. Uh, and I think of this in, in terms of a kind of Minsky process. Minsky for those of you who, who, who don't know him in detail or haven't come across his work, always talked about the economy as a, a, a structure of balance sheets, you know, where, where you have obligations from previous commitments. So I've agreed to pay my mortgage. I've agreed to pay, you know, my phone bill, et cetera, et cetera, and income. And if your cash income falls and your expected cash income or legally required cash outflow uh, is still there, then you're in trouble. You're bankrupt. Um, so I think we're kind of preventing a Minsky type dominoes falling effect is, is what the, the aim of government policy should be. And my hunch is that well, not my hunch, my, my view is that while much of the government policy is very welcome, particularly the job uh, retention scheme, the ability to furlough workers and the government to cover up to 80 percent of wages um, is very welcome, as are other schemes. I don't think they're sufficient. And I think there's been too much reliance on loans, on credit and not enough on either direct cash transfers, grant type transfers, or 
payment suspensions of certain types uh, of payments. And so I think that the damage that's occurring to the economy in terms of job losses, in terms of firms' bankruptcies uh, and rising um, credit problems, you know, balance sheets um, deteriorating, I think are severe. And I think the longer it goes on, and we don't know how long it will go on, the, the worse these problems will get. And I think these have quite important implications for once we do start trying to remove the lockdown and get activity going again, there will be lasting damage. But the terminology which is emerging here is scarring. Um, economists are talking about scarring effects. Uh, in the economics literature, this has been referred to as hysteresis uh, effects, i.e. sort of long run uh, either GDP level or even GDP growth uh, rate effects from recessions. And we saw it quite clearly, I think, after 2008. The growth rate didn't return to its previous growth rate. The productivity growth rate collapsed from about 2% to close to zero. So all uh, almost all GDP growth in the last 10 years came from population expansion, effectively, rather than higher output per head. So I think it's very likely we'll see um, this, this kind of effect again, uh, and possibly more extreme. So that's where I think we are now in terms uh, of policy. Once we come out of the, the lockdown, whenever that may be, um, and as I said, I think it's going to be a, a prolonged um, and difficult and phased process, at that point, we're going to have to start thinking in terms of the supply side versus the demand side. Where are the bottlenecks in, in the economy? Where are the shortages of things, potentially food, for example, um, leading to price rises? Um, and there are a number of you know, elements in the argument that we're going to see supply side bottlenecks. One is that global trade is going to break down. And those you know, fairly fragile cross-border global supply chains, which relied on just-in-time production, goods moving very rapidly through different um, economies and so on uh, will break down and, and won't reconstitute themselves quickly. And we're also in the context of you know, anti-globalization um, sentiment from all over the place, you know, from Trump to people on the left. So I think the likelihood that we're going to get back to, you know, those global supply chains quickly uh, or, or possibly even ever uh, is, is unlikely. Other reasons why we might see inflationary pressure are demographics and aging population is often invoked. It's not clear to me that, that that link is clear. I think you could also argue that aging populations lead to deflationary pressure, but it's sometimes there. Um, and, and there are other uh, elements to that story. On the demand side, why might we see you know, severe demand shortfalls as we as we exit from um, the lockdown. Well, people are going to be well, at the moment during lockdown, people are not spending because they can't. Now, once we start to come out of the lockdown, people may not spend because they, they won't or because they can't for different reasons. Now, they won't possibly because they're scared. You know, people may not want to go back into crowded nightclubs and into cinemas and into crowded public transport and so on. So I think there's there's good evidence coming out of polling that people are not immediately just going to start rushing out and going out and being in crowded areas or you know even once the government says sure you know go to Cheltenham Festival or go to Liverpool versus Atletico or whatever it's safe people may look at the government and say well, I don't really trust you you know I don't think it's safe I'm I'm going to stay home so I think there's good evidence that people are not going to be um, spending I think there's evidence that balance sheets will have deteriorated as I said during the crisis so some people will have racked up debts just to you know, keep keeping their houses or whatever and we will not be able to do anything other than pay down those debts. I think there's probably a fairly severe income distribution process going on, which I think is a really pernicious effect of the lockdown in that you know, relatively well off middle class people like myself who so far haven't seen you know, job losses. I haven't yet been told that I'm redundant or my, my salary is going to be cut or if salary are cut, they're not like, cut by large amounts effectively stop spending and unless they actually make an effort like I try and make an effort to try and actually keep spending by giving money to people I used to give money to even though they're not helping me in the way they used to people like me will accumulate cash balances you know not driving ubers not going to restaurants not going to bars and so on whereas the people who rely on in, on, on those things driving ubers serving in bars making coffees etc don't have an income many of them are on precarious contracts they're effectively unemployed now so there's been I think a wholesale shift in wealth you know income distribution from those least able to take the hit to those most able to take to take the, to take the hit um i do think it's incumbent on those who have seen their 
who have done well financially out of this crisis, and as a sort of personal point, I think it's incumbent on those people to find ways to, to get rid of that money. You know, if, you, if you've made two grand out of being in lockdown, I think you should give the money to charity or you should, you know, pay all the, the services that you didn't pay in the meantime or something to try and uh, even it out a bit. Uh, but otherwise, the government should, should come and, and, and look at the balance sheets at some point and, and, and tax. Um, so I think there is alongside that, that where these two interact, we've got the, the damage to the supply side, the hysteresis effects. Um, and the longer there's a demand side recession and you know, a kind of depression as we come out of lockdown, you know, if there isn't government, strong government stimulus at that point, I think there's a, there's a very plausible scenario where you get sustained recession, almost into depression, that worsens the hysteresis effects. You get you know, more layoffs, skill losses, lack of investments and so on. Um, and that can be very dangerous potentially because it, it means that when we do finally start to try and come out into a, a growth path, it's going to be constrained. So let me, I'm aware that I'm up to half an hour, so I need to start drawing to a conclusion. There's still lots more I could say, but maybe we can, I can say some of it in the um, Q&A. Uh, with Rob Calvert Jump, um, my co-author, I've been doing some work on projections and forecasts of the government finances. Uh, and we were um, stimulated to do this by the Office for Budget Responsibility scenario, what they called the coronavirus reference scenario, which came out uh, a few weeks back. And what the OBR showed was they predicted, or they're careful not to say they were predicting it, but their scenario showed uh, a very severe contraction in GDP of around 35%. So currently they think that the economy is operating at about 65% in terms of the cash value of transactions that's taking place relative to the pre cross um, situation. But what they show in their scenario is that that reverses completely uh, to the point that the GDP path returns to its long run trend from, from pre crisis. You can draw a line straight through on their charts. I don't know if you can see my hand here. And you kind of get a V shape, which just joins up the beginning and the end, and then it carries on. So their, their pre crisis projections are identical to their post crisis projections, with the exception of this V shape. And the good news about that is it means that government debt to GDP does spike up, the deficit spikes up, but it immediately closes. And, you know, we see an increase in government debt to GDP. Uh, it peaks at about 110 percent and comes back down, I think, to about 90 percent. Um, for context, before 2008, UK government debt to GDP was about 40 percent. It went up to about 80, 90 percent um, during that crisis. And it hasn't really come down much since. The deficit has, has closed. Um, but the, the debt to GDP ratio hasn't actually changed a great deal. So what Rob and I have done, and these hopefully should be published next week, um, if you're interested, is done some alternative projections where we assume a weaker bounce back and these kind of hysteresis effects. And what we show is that we think a plausible, we actually kind of show fan charts of the range of possible outcomes, and they're pretty wide because the uncertainty is so high, but our central projections for a kind of shortish lockdown um, which ends reasonably soon, so a three-month-ish lockdown, followed by reasonably um, rapid return to long-run-ish growth trends. Government debt to GDP goes to about 120% and stays there. Worsen the assumptions, i.e., let's say, a six-month lockdown with hysteresis effects, and then you're looking at more like 140, 150% uh, of GDP. And as you, you know, increase the length of the lockdown and worsen your assumptions about what could come after, this number rises. Uh, and what we've done is we've made a little kind of interactive tool so people can even play with this themselves and generate their own forecasts. So uh, that should be out next week or, or so, hopefully. But the, the policy conclusion to all this, I mean, why are we doing this? Why are we giving these neoliberals, you know, ammunition? Why are we showing these debt to GDP ratios uh, and so on? Um, I think forewarned is forearmed. I think it's quite dangerous that the OBR are, are putting out these scenarios saying, you know, we're going to be roughly in the same place in terms of government finance as we were in two years time, we're going to be about where we are now. I don't think we are. I think on paper, the numbers are going to be bigger. And that means the headlines. That means the newspaper headlines saying, you know, highest debt to GDP since 1973 or whatever the, the, the relevant number is. And it means the usual talking heads on the radio and on the television saying, you know, this is all very sad. We're all going to be in it together, but we've got to do what we did again in 2008. And I think we need to be ready this time. I think we need to be ready with the, it's coming. These are the kind of numbers we're looking at. And in my view, these kind of numbers, 120 percent, even 130, 140 percent, with sensible policies on the sequencing of bond issuance, 
with sensible use of the Bank of England as a stabilization mechanism to ensure that debt can be issued uh, smoothly. Potentially some of it can be monetized through quantitative easing. The Bank of England have already basically said they're going to do that. I don't see any real reason why we have to go for any kind of austerity strategy in the sense of government spending cuts um, and so on. And what we need to be thinking about is some kind of fiscal stimulus strategy in the in the possibility that we do get a kind of um, a depression type scenario emerging. We need to be ready with you know a serious fiscal stimulus package, and we think about what are the areas of focus. You know, should it be infrastructure, but should it be social care? Uh, obviously, it should be green uh, and so on. And we need to think about the arguments on you know, this can be financed, it can be done sustainably. Um, so it's not going to be the same arguments as 2010. We're not going to lose the argument in the way we did in 2010. OK, I've, I've overrun by five minutes, so I'm going to wrap up there. That's my conclusion. I'm going to hand back to Raza, and hopefully Raza's going to know what I need to do. I've seen lots of questions coming in, but I've been carefully not reading them. I get distracted. <laughs> there have been plenty of questions. Uh, thanks for that. Um, let's get started and actually turn focus maybe towards the European and other countries first and then come back to the UK. So we had a question, mm -hmm. um, well actually I know you spoke about the UK's relationship with austerity, but the European dynamics are different with calls for yeah. shared debt burden, but those were called down. And the European stability mechanism has a clause which imposes austerity if you reach into it. Um, also Toby has a question. The Bank of England has the option of doing monetary financing, but the ECB has mm -hmm. explicitly prohibited by the Maastricht treaties, so any new public debt will mean higher debt service in the future. If the ECB is not allowed to absorb this additional burden through monetary financing, isn't a reduction of public debt the unavoidable response? Okay, these are good questions. So the political economy in Europe is more complicated, of course, than in the UK because of the complexities of the Eurozone. And I think it's, it's very widely accepted now. It was pointed out by a fairly small number of critics at the time, but I think it's widely accepted that that's a deeply flawed uh, institutional arrangement, a monetary union without corresponding fiscal um, government uh, union. Um, and that means that the, 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 the macro dynamics there are very much driven by intergovernmental politics or intercountry politics in a way that, you know, in the UK, it's determined by internal fights between those who want more austerity and those who don't. In the Eurozone, it's determined by countries that, you know, have a kind of austere mindset that, that think, you know, budgets should be balanced. The Germans have this you know, black zero thing. That we, it's just completely mad. It's it's so far from any kind of sensible macroeconomics that it's just so hard to comprehend for, you know, for someone like me. In a situation like this, the statements that still come out from northern European countries about fiscal rectitude and the balancing the budgets and you know, not doing unconventional monetary policies that could endanger monetary stability and so on, it's exactly the, the wrong way around. And, and there has to be some kind of burden sharing. There has to be, you know, the only solution that I can see for the European system is um, some kind of joint debt issuance and guarantees for the, for the weaker nations, the weaker financially weaker nations, um, monetary uh, sovereignties, if you like, of the by, by the richer nations. I'm not optimistic that we're going to see it, and we could talk about the details of the various programs. But really, it's the politics which which matters here. Um, we have seen. I mean, the ECB has been sensible, and the ECB has done, I think, quite a lot, and is and is still announcing more measures. But the ECB, if you read between the lines, basically says that there's only so much we can do. You know, the governments have to have to step up. We have seen finally some slightly more sensible messages in the, in, the, in more recent weeks from northern states, including Germany, saying actually we're going to suspend the usual restrictions about fiscal um, balances and so on. But I mean, the, the 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 kind of the mechanics, the macro mechanics, isn't that different to the UK. It's just bigger and it's across a, a more heterogeneous, not even heterogeneous. I mean, UK is incredibly heterogeneous. You look at income and productivity levels from London up to the northeast or something. It's actually kind of comparable to the eurozone. So it's really a question of size and political um, will. Uh, and I just think we have to keep trying to try and keep up the pressure. But I don't feel optimistic. I mean, I I, I do have, have the sense that northern European elites would almost rather stick to the sort of the stupid path to the point that it causes disintegration and you know, it causes 
Italy just to say I can't take any more. At some point, you know, I, I, I've always been, a, you know, somebody who wanted to keep the European project together and who's defended it despite all its manifest flaws, and that's a very big debate. Um, but you know, you do see at that point, countries like Italy just do have to say, you know, this is this is ridiculous. You know, we can't put up with this anymore. But I hope we don't. I really hope we don't get to that. Um, did I answer the question? Was there a, something about monetary financing? Yeah, I mean, the, the, in terms of monetary financing, the ECB can kind of do it through the back door. I mean, there are ways, I mean, there's a big debate about whether QE is monetary financing. I mean, what happens with quantitative easing is the Treasury, so in the UK, the Treasury sells gilts, government bonds, to say a pension fund. And at the same time, the Bank of England is buying those gilts, or actually different gilts, from pension funds. So as long as there's a private sector agent steps in and then you get price formation and then you're not worried because you can pretend that really the interest rates are being determined by the game between the pension funds and the treasury. It's not the Bank of England which is setting the rates of interest. Nobody buys it. It's not true. But the Bank of England comes and buys those gilts from the pension fund and we can all sort of pretend that there isn't monetary financing going on. It, the, the ECB can, can and is doing similar kinds of, of creative tricks. Um, but it would be kind of useful if we had a bit less of the, the sort of the breathing down the neck and the restrictions saying, you, you know, you really mustn't do this. It's not sound finance. It, it is. It's perfectly reasonable. Great. Thank you. Um, we've had, had some questions about context outside of the European Union and the UK. So some developing countries. Has austerity been implemented in those countries? And are the macroeconomic effects particularly acute for them of this corona crisis? Okay, that's a really good question, and it's a really big debate. And actually, I think you're going to have a seminar on this topic. You know, Keston Perry is, is, is online for, for that, so I, I'll, I'll leave quite a lot for him. One thing I've been watching, I mean, it, it's, it's very country and case specific, but I think there's, a, there's a, an overriding point here, which is that rich countries like the UK, like the Eurozone, although they don't want to use it, like the US, have enormous capacity effectively because people want to hold instruments denominated in the, in those currencies, in pounds, in, in dollars and so on, whether they are government debt instruments, government bonds, whether they're just cash, you know, bank deposits of, of various types uh, or stocks and shares and other kinds of financial instruments. And that gives governments in those countries a lot of leeway to spend and to use the central bank as a mechanism to smooth that spending by you know, expanding um, the money supply, very crudely speaking. Because ultimately, people will will to, to a not to an unlimited degree. I, I actually don't think there's 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 no limit to this. But I think to a fairly wide degree, people will accept those instruments. Will accept pounds and dollars. That isn't the case for many countries who are lower down what I would call a global currency hierarchy, um, who are reliant on the use, particularly of dollars, for international trading to finance trade deficits, to finance. Um, the need for capital goods to finance the need for hydrocarbons, you know, for oil imports, if they're oil importing nations. Um, and what we've seen during the austerity period, alongside the austerity in, in rich countries, was very loose monetary policy to counteract, I think, actually, the macro effects of, of the fiscal austerity. You try and keep growth on the road by cutting interest rates very low, pumping liquidity into the system. And one result of that has been um, a flight, not a flight, but a movement from rich country financial instruments into so-called emerging market or emerging economy instruments. So I think monetary loosening and, and very loose credit conditions in rich countries has led rich country investors to, to take uh, positions against instruments in poorer countries that pay higher rates of interest. And what we've seen since the crisis struck is a rapid uh, reversal of that, you know, a kind of sudden stop where money has flown out of uh, poor countries into the dollar, everybody's trying to hold dollars. We have seen um, Federal Reserve action to expand access to what are called swap facilities, which allow other countries, banks that can't issue dollars to keep their banking systems afloat or fund their businesses or whatever to access dollars. But I don't think it's been nearly strong enough. I would like to see much stronger IMF action to make loans using what are called special drawing rights. It's a kind of monetary instrument that the IMF issues without conditionality. One of the problems with the IMF is they usually impose fiscal austerity as a side effect of, you, you know, you, you want this loan, you have to impose structural adjustment on your economy. That would be, would be catastrophic. Uh, 
So I think there's a real problem. And actually, I, I was a kind of coordinator of a letter to the FT quite early on. I, don't know, I can't remember how long ago now. Time is a blur, six weeks or so maybe. Um, really urging rich countries to think about this issue. The fact that they have the monetary, you know, what the MMT is called monetary sovereignty. I think it's a useful term to a much greater extent than, than those poorer countries uh, and, and to, to take that into account and, and to not allow these international financial dynamics to constrain those governments in their their responses, their responses to the health crisis and the macro crisis, because we do need all countries pretty much to be able to run big government responses. That means deficits. And that does mean an international sort of solidarity in terms of money and finance. Again, I'm not optimistic, but, you know, we have to say this is what this is what's needed. I agree. Um, so there are some policy related questions. People are asking you for your opinion on some policies. So you mm. mentioned supporting payments, suspending payments, or the government is actually acting as the ultimate backstop. Do you think yeah. debt forgiveness is a viable policy? Um, there's other policy related questions. Does the need for fiscal stimulus present the perfect opportunity for a Green New Deal? And what do you think about the strategy of trying to inflate away at least partially, government debt. Yep, yeah, these are all excellent questions. Good. Um, debt forgiveness. It depends on which debts. It's, it's a complicated one. In general, I lean towards, I mean, it's not a blanket answer, but I lean towards using creative lending accounting rather than technical debt write offs, because debt write offs cause kind of domino reactions you know they cause credit events they cause technical defaults and these things can cause kind of domino reactions which can make a mess what you can do is you can refinance debts and pretend that they're going to be paid off when they when they're not you can refinance them at basically zero rates of interest hide them on balance sheets leave them there for 20 30 years and then by the time it's 20 30 years you know who cares this is kind of what the government does with student loans they know that a big chunk of student loans are never going to be paid off um so i would be of you know as a very first cut and not in all cases there are clearly some debts which just should not have been made and are you know what's the, what's the word unethical or there's a technical term i can't think of immediately and those should be struck off but there's a, a big gray area where it's kind of a mess and I, for that i think extend and pretend you know refinance them for 30 years at close to zero bury them somewhere and then you've basically written them off without the mess of um, the credit defaults and so on. But there's a, there's a big debate there and you'd actually have to go through it. I mean, there's a difference between mortgage debts and student loans and credit cards and payday lenders and, and so on and so forth. And the answer is different, I think, in, in each case. Does this provide us with the opportunity for a, a Green New Deal? Yes. I mean, the short answer is, from my perspective, from the way I think about the world, everything provides us an opportunity for a Green New Deal because that's what I want to see. Again, I'm not optimistic. I think we're going to see... Um, fairly strong uh, action to get things back to as close to normal, uh, pre-crisis, pre-corona normal um, as possible. Um, I've actually got something I've been working on with Yanis, I think it's on the call, and Daniela, thinking about you know, what are the kind of prospects for um, you know, green policy versus kind of greenwashing. You know, to what extent are we going to see lots of branding of financial instruments as green investments? But don't actually have a great deal of effect in terms of actual carbon reductions to prevent present new uh, opportunities for financial investors uh, and so on um so i think things are going to change i don't think we're going to go back to to normal that's already a cliche to say you know the world has changed we're never going back but i think there's going to be a push to get back to the kinds of in many ways the more pernicious elements of of normal i uh, sort of slightly a finance dominated um, type of capitalism with carity. I think surveillance is a very interesting question because we're talking about increased use of surveillance and technology um, as, a, as a way of getting out for contact tracing and so on. And I'm very much in favor of that. But we're, there's already discussion about surveillance capitalism and surveillance workers through digital technology. Uh, and I think that that's going to be an element. So yes, I, I think there are kind of two paths ahead of us. There's there's the Green New Deal. You know, big investments, you know, social solidarity, redistribution, confronting the power of finance. That's very much the, the I would like us to go down. But there's also the, you know, back to as close to business as usual as possible in the new normal. And, you know, if I had to bet, I'm afraid I would bet on the latter. But, you know, those of us who agree with me, get ready to, to fight for the, the former. I think about that right way. You, you get the point. Um, what about the prospects 
for inflation um, as a way of getting us out of, of debt uh, to GDP ratios. There are two stories about how you get out of high debt to GDP ratios that I'm increasingly wary of. Um, and if you look at the post-war experience, what you saw was a reasonably high nominal inflation until mid 60s when it becomes you know, more, more severe and it becomes the, the major policy issue uh, alongside rapid growth. And the combination of those things, you know, rapid real and nominal growth, plus you know, fairly healthy you know, sustained inflation, brought down debt to GDP ratios from post-war highs of about 200, 250%. Uh, fairly rapidly um, down to to sort of where we saw them in the in the 80s and 90s. I, I am dubious about either of those processes. I don't think we're going to see a return to long run high growth. And I'm not, I, I'm increasingly convinced by the green arguments that actually we don't want to be. I mean, perhaps creative accounting, we can count thing, more things in GDP. So we, we call GDP higher, for example. But actually, I do think we need to start thinking about redistributing activity, redistributing working hours. And this is a really big debate. But even if we did want to go for, you know, to hell with the carbon emissions, let's just drive the economy as hard as we can and get 5% post-war type growth rates. I'm just dubious. I think that's a kind of historical phase, which is quite unusual. And I think it probably has come to an end. I also think inflation with very wide error bands, I would say here, I'm not completely discounting a post-corona supply side inflationary scenario. I think it's, it's, I think it's unlikely, but I think it's plausible. And actually, one thing we should be talking about is what are the correct policy responses there? Because it's quite a different policy environment to be arguing. Um, but I, I think it's low likelihood. I think actually deflationary pressure, persisting deflationary, you know, so-called secular stagnation, although I'm not convinced by the theoretical underpinnings of, of the story, is, is more likely. And therefore, I just can't see the inflationary pressure. And very crudely, I think a big driver of inflation is workers being able to put the demand wage rises. That I think is, is a really key element of an infl a sustained inflationary process. So not just a one-off increase in prices. Food bottlenecks, you know, for a short period might lead to sharply higher food prices for a while. But unless they keep rising, it's not inflation. It's just, you know, a change in the price of a particular category of goods. I think for sustained inflation, you do need wage pressure. You need workers to be able to, to say, I, I want to pay rise. And for firms to, to react to that, to try and protect their profit margins by raising prices. And the stories I'm hearing, and this is anecdotal at this point, is that people aren't agitating for pay rises in the current situation. And I don't think it's likely they're going to be. I'm actually hearing of forced pay cuts. And people who are keeping their jobs have been told your salary is 80% or 70%. And if you don't like it, you know, off you go. So my hunch is that, that's a long answer. I, I, I don't completely discount an inflationary scenario, but I would definitely have it sort of under 5% in my range of, of, of outcomes. So I think the most likely is ongoing weak or even negative inflation and in that case you're not going to get nominal debt nominal you're not going to get debt to gdp um down through through inflation so i think we need to start making arguments about the sustainability of government finances with big balance sheets you know we can live with 100 120 130 percent we don't need growth to, to erode it we don't need inflation to erode it we just have to accept that that's you know people want to hold those safe assets of that kind of size and they're showing us they want to hold those safe assets by interest rates. Um, so I think those are the kind of arguments I would I would push rather than you know growth will take care of the deficit, which which was true in the 60s and 70s, but it's 50s and 60s, but it's I think less convincing now. Great. I'm just conscious of time, so I'll yes. put some questions in about the future. So um, how long do you think government support will need to be in place? Um, there are some questions around furlough. So considering at at the moment, the furlough scheme is protecting many household jobs. How long do you believe the government can afford to carry on these payments before we see huge job losses similar to the US, which may exacerbate the recession and depression? Um, related to that, is there any good reason to be concerned about too much debt to GDP increases? And um, are there any, are any government showing signs that they would act differently in terms of austerity following this crisis compared to the financial crisis? Okay, those are all good questions. How long can the furlough go on? How much will it cost? Do we even care about debt to GDP? Um, and I've lost the third one. Tell me the third one again. Um, the third one was, are there any signs that governments are acting differently? Ah, yes. Will act differently post-COVID compared to the financial crisis? Yes. 
Yeah, okay, that's a really good question. All of them are really good. How long can the furlough scheme go on? Um, it's a really good question. Back of an envelope, we have budgeted something like 15 billion per month of lockdown, give or take. So the deficit, we're sort of projecting something in the order of 350 billion for this year, which is huge. It's unprecedented. It's kind of 12, 13 percent of, of GDP. It's, it's bigger than the deficit we saw uh, in 2008, much bigger in nominal terms, kind of twice as big, but also bigger in percentage terms. Each additional quarter of lockdown you know, with the full job furlough guarantee, job guarantee, job furlough scheme, shouldn't mix my terminology and so on we'll add large numbers to that. So we, we could see up, up to sort of 500 billion, um, which is a very large figure. You're talking 20, 25% uh, of GDP. How much can be afforded? This kind of connects to the second question of, you know, how much does debt to GDP matter? And the honest answer is, we don't know where the limit is. We don't know at which point people start selling the pound, people start saying, I don't want to hold um, you know, gilts. Sure, the Bank of England can buy gilts. It, it can intervene to stabilize the, the interest rate by, by purchasing gilts. At the limit, then people just say they don't want to hold these kind of instruments by just selling the pound wholesale. And sure, we can take 10, 15, 20% depreciation of the pound, which wouldn't hurt that much, but sustained selling and, and you know real de depreciation of the pound would hurt. And ultimately, one way or another, it, it will hurt. Um, I, but I, I think those technical questions about where is the limit are probably more less pressing than political um, considerations. I just can't see the Conservative government sitting for nine months paying large, I mean, increasing proportion of the workforce wages and watching that kind of deficit rack up. The OBR will, producing different, will be producing different kind of charts. The right wing press will be screaming, you know, about all kinds of things, you know, the debt to GDP ratio is going to kill our grandchildren and so on. So I really think probably the political considerations will kick in before the actual the genuine macro financial um, considerations. My best guess is that beyond about six months, the kind of numbers you're looking at will just be not the kind of numbers that a conservative chancellor will, will be able to, to stomach. I mean, already we've seen, I saw a very nice summary of this. Um, during austerity, they wouldn't spend any money to change things, you know, for the better. What we're seeing now is they're spending huge amounts of money to try and keep things as they were, you know, to try and stop things getting getting better. They're not spending money in the way that would really lead to, to change social change and improvement. Um, but the kinds of money they're spending, even just to keep things as they were, you know, through loan guarantees and job furloughs and so on, I think are going to become politically very difficult. So I, my, my hunch is that beyond about six months of this kind of full lockdown, you, you know, they're, they're sort of get the economy going, let the mortality rate go up side of the, the debate, we'll, we'll start winning and, and we'll, we'll, I really hope we don't get there and I hope that we can get the lockdown strong enough for the next few months, get some kind of tracking and tracing in place that we actually can start coming out, you know, in a kind of South Korea type scenario without the mortality rates going up, without our rising and therefore we don't have to have these horrible fiscal arguments because that's a real mess, I think. Um, and this is a really good one, actually, to end on. To what extent were we already post-austerity? Because if you remember Rishi Sunak's first budget before um, coronavirus, before we fully comprehended the scale of it, was the end of austerity. Big increases, what looked like headline huge increases in government spending, deficit rises, to hell with the deficit and, and the debt. And, you know, many people, myself included, said, look, this shows they never really believed it. They knew that there was never a financial constraint. They just... You know, they wanted to do it and now they, they've realized that actually it's politically inconvenient and they do need to spend money on leveling up and, and, and so on. Um, I think there's definitely going to be um, a camp still within the, you know, the conservatives and within the kind of Republican camp in the US, which is going to stick with that much looser fiscal kind of um, sense. But I think there's also going to be a camp pushing for austerity in the sense of government cuts. Even if we do get the kind of big budget Toryism and big budget re Republicanism, and historically, of course, in the US, it's always the Republicans that run the big budgets. They always talk up a game about, you know, you can't run budget deficits because they want the, the Democrats to cut Social Security um, spending. But when they get in, they always just hand out money to their friends through tax cuts and run big, big deficits. So they, they don't, they don't buy it. Um, so I, I, I do think there was a shift. There was a really noticeable shift from that sort of camp. But I still think there are there are there are fights within that camp between the kind of the true Austerians 
and the, the kind of to hell with it big deficit tax cuts for the rich kind of camp even if the, the latter camp win it's going to be ugly you know it's not going to be green new deal um so there's a fight there and and we really mustn't mistake the ends for the means a big deficit isn't the, the thing we're aiming for it's the thing which allows us if we need it to get to the place we're going which is better jobs better security environmental protections and so on um so let's not con you know mix the two up you know we, we don't just want big deficits for the sake of it okay i think we're getting close to time limit here we are. Um, so as we're nearing the end, Joe, I'll come back to you for maybe just a, a very brief conclusion and your main takeaways. Okay. Um, I think you can probably all guess pretty much my, my views on this from, from what I've said. Um, we are in a, in a completely, I'm going to try not to use the word unprecedented because as, as if people keep saying there's an unprecedented use of the term, but it's very hard to, to, to know how to think about the current situation. Normal macro models don't apply. So I, my, my, my argument was that the standard supply demand analysis isn't currently useful. We're in kind of freeze frame on ice, lender of last resort type situation. As we come out, those traditional macro arguments are going to come back. Um, I think there's a huge range of possible outcomes. They depend on policy. They depend on medical um, developments and so on. But my current sort of central scenario is weak demand, the need for fiscal stimulus and the need to you know, push against austerity arguments with high debt to GDP ratios and push for, you know, socially useful government spending, you know, Green New Deal type um, spending. But we'll see for the next few months how things unfold and see whether that story is still where we are in you know, two, three months time. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Joe, for your insight into what the COVID-19 crisis means for the future of the austerity agenda and the macro implications. I think we've had a really interesting conversation and some great questions. Sorry that we haven't been able to get to all your questions, but you can keep the conversation going on social media. Um, you can follow along. Um, I'll put down the links in the chat box. Um, the next webinar will be this Wednesday, 6th of May, at the same time, 3 to 4 p.m. UK time. It will be on COVID-19 and debt crises. The speaker will be Christina Lascaridis and the moderator, Asbar Bin Azizi, both from SOAS. In the meantime, as I mentioned at the start, you can stay updated um, on the series and the wider conversation on social media. Um, now, all I have to um, say is I hope you all stay safe and well, and I hope to see you on Wednesday. Goodbye.